Hello, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone, everyone joining this um, first COVID-19 live Q&A in 2022 with Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Van Kerkhov. Um, we wish you all happier and healthier this new year in which we hope that we will find ways to stop this virus and uh, go back to normal lives as many of us probably wished in the New Year's Eve. Um, Mike, Maria, thank you for your time. Um, and as unfortunately we've seen that this year has started with a new record of COVID-19 cases, um, maybe we can start this conversation with an update from you on the epidemiological situation. Where are the hotspots? Why are these happening? And as we've had a bit of a break since we last heard from you in this format. So hi, Alex. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks um, for having this again, and Happy New Year to everybody. Hope everyone had uh, some opportunity to rest and relax and take a break um, from uh, the craziness of 2021 and 2020, um, and wishing you all a happy, healthy, safe uh, 2022. Um, so yes, indeed, uh, we have started this year out um, with record numbers of cases being reported to WHO. Um, our weekly epidemiologic update will come out later today uh, if it's not published yet, and you will see that um, more than 15 million cases were reported in the last seven days. That's a record high um, in this pandemic. We've actually had to readjust the scale in the figures that you will see in the epi curve um, that will be published. This is up from 9.5 million that were reported last week. So we are seeing a sharp increase in cases being reported around the world. About half of those have been reported from Europe. About 40% of all cases reported from the Americas, um, with a high burden of cases from the US, um, and increases across uh, many of our, our regions. The only decline uh, we saw in cases was in Africa. But I think one of the things we need to understand, um, and this isn't anything new, is that we do have challenges with case detection um, and reporting. And this has to do with access to tests. Uh, we, we don't have um, adequate access to life-saving tools such as diagnostic tests around the world. We need to continue to fight for that. But it also doesn't take into account um, challenges in surveillance around the world as well as people who are self-testing at home and those don't get registered. So we know that the 15 million is an underestimate. Um, with regards to deaths, um, we had more than 43,000 deaths reported to WHO. So you do see quite a change in terms of the case numbers uh, and a lower proportion of cases are dying. We still have 43,000 people who died in the last seven days alone. And every single one of those cases and uh, those deaths is a tragedy because we have tools at hand. Um, and we also have to remember that um, with the emergence of Omicron, which is the latest variant of concern that WHO classified at the end of November, that is circulating widely, and it is very efficiently transmitted uh, between people. That is what is resulting in this increase, in this sharp increase in cases. Omicron has been detected in all countries where we have good sequencing, um, and it's likely to be in all countries around the world. And it is quickly taking over in terms of its circulation. It's overtaking Delta. Um, and so Omicron is becoming the dominant variant that is being detected. Now it takes some time for Omicron to overtake Delta in some countries because it depends on the level of circulation of Delta. So the cases that we are seeing, the hospitalizations that we are seeing are both a result of Delta and Omicron. Um, and I think what we are cautioning is that even though we do have some information that Omicron causes less severe disease than Delta, it's not a mild disease. It is not just a mild disease. And this is really important because people are still being hospitalized for Omicron. As Omicron spreads and as Omicron infects people who have underlying conditions, who, have, who are of an older age, and certainly who are not vaccinated, those three groups of individuals have a higher risk of developing severe disease. And what we are seeing is hospitalizations are increasing. And so the sheer volume of cases results in higher hospitalizations, plus as Omicron enters and circulates among vulnerable populations, we will see increasing hospitalizations and deaths. So please, you know, treat this virus as seriously as it needs to be treated. It's not to, be, it's not to scare anybody, but the, the narrative that it's the common cold is not true. 
the narrative that it is just mild is not true. So we have to really f fight against it. It's not the time to give up. Um, and I think that's one of, the, one of the key messages I want to get across today, that it's not the time to give up. We have tools at hand that can keep people safe. Vaccinations among all, you know, all of those at risk all over the world, plus using tools to drive down transmission. The two sides of that equation are, are very critical right now, and we really just need to reinforce that comprehensive strategy. Um, Mike, any, any comments from you on the current situation? No, I think um, Maria uh, <clears throat> says it all, but it's, it's, I, I suppose it's something that everyone out there is, we're all still waiting to get the sort of definitive information on this wave of Omicron um, variant uh, around the world. And, and people are sort of naturally hoping, and we all should hope, and we should all uh, have the right to hope that... Uh, this this variant uh, <clears throat> will be the last one we see, but the reality is that uh, we can't expect that to be the last variant that we will see. Um, <clears throat> the and also, I think uh, people are and Maria is correct. They're they're maybe mistakenly wishing that this, as we all would wish, uh, that this is mild, but. To characterize this as mild uh, it would be very rash at this point. I think we can definitely say that an, an Omicron variant it causes on average a less severe disease mm -hmm. uh, in any human being, but that's on average. There are hundreds of thousands of people around the world in hospital as we speak w with the Omicron variant, um, and for them that's a very severe disease. Um, the reason why we're seeing so many people in hospital is because there are just so many infections. As Maria mentioned, we had to change the scale. We actually had to change the scale on our, we've, we've been using these graphs for <laughs> two years, and we literally had to change the scale on the graph just to get the peak in on the graph, um, which shows you just how uh, widespread the infection is right now. And that's in the context of very limited availability of tests. Mm -hmm. As Maria said, even in developed and industrialized countries, it's very hard to get a test now. Uh, and that doesn't, in most cases, include antigen positive tests. That's mainly PCR positive tests. So you can only imagine just how many infections there are. And that's really not good. Uh, what is reassuring is that it's only a very small proportion of those individuals are winding up very sick or in hospital or dying. Um, some of that is people been reinfected who've been previously had a, a natural infection. Um, some of that is people been re reinfected who had a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, but what we do see is that those people who've had a full course of vaccination previously, while they may become reinfected, have a significant level of protection against severe disease and death. And that's very important for people to, to, to understand right now, um, is that the protection is there. And uh, you have the, the possibility of being reinfected, yes, and everyone talks about, oh my God, the vaccines have failed because my brother or my sister or my friend down the road had another infection. I've had colleagues and friends of mine who had a pretty severe infection with Omicron, and uh, my view is I am so glad they had the vaccine because I'm wondering to myself how sick might they have been if they hadn't had the vaccine before. And I think people need to consider that, that while the vaccine may not prevent illness, I would rather have an illness that puts me in bed for a few days rather than have an illness that puts me six foot in the ground. And unfortunately, that's the reality. For people who are unvaccinated, Omicron still represents a massive threat to their life and a massive threat to their health. And people should really look at this in terms of really seriously consider getting out there and getting vaccinated. And this is not just a story for the developing world. There is huge inequity in vaccination still. But this is also, in many industrialized countries, there are pockets of individuals who don't have access to the vaccine or who refuse vaccine. And I think at this point, it's really important, given what we're seeing with Omicron, that people um, do everything in their power to get vaccinated, especially if they're offered that vaccine. Can we, can we we may come back to vaccination, but I mean, I think that's worth reinforcing. Vaccination is saving lives. Um, you are much better protected against developing severe disease, needing hospitalization, or dying if you are vaccinated. So get vaccinated when it's your turn. And really, I mean, you heard us speak, and the Director General spoke about this last week uh, and, and repeatedly, that all of us need to be advocating for vaccine equity around the world. It's not just about you 
and you having access to the vaccine and even just your loved ones. Um, get vaccinated when it's your turn. But we have an entire global population. I was looking at the data today and it's something like more than 3 billion people around the world have not had access to their first or second dose. That's a huge number of people around the world. And there should be much more outrage that's out there. This is a global problem needing a global solution. And vaccination is a right. People should have access to this, and particularly those who are most vulnerable, because we are in this together. Whether we like it or not, we will not end this pandemic in one country at the expense of others. So I think that's something that we really need to hammer home. We've heard a lot of questions. I don't know, Alex, if you've seen in the social media, or Mike, if you've heard, but I've had a lot of people say, well, why bother? Omicron is everywhere, and I might as well just get infected now. That's a very dangerous question, and it's one worth answering. Um, the reason we don't want this virus to circulate is, number one, your chance of developing severe disease um, is real. If you have underlying conditions, are of an older age, if you've not received a vaccination, you could die. And that's what we want to prevent, and we can prevent that. But you can also pass the virus to somebody else who is more vulnerable. We are just learning about post-COVID condition, long COVID. We don't know the implications of Omicron, which replicates in the upper respiratory tract as opposed to the lower respiratory tract, and if that has any implication on your chances of developing longer-term effects. So that's reason enough not to get infected. Um, but it's, there are so many unknowns about this, about you know, the, you know, an acute infection as well as long-term effects, that it's really, please you know, be careful. We've heard some, I've heard some very scary stories about you know, parties of people and, and trying to get infected. Please, um, that is very unsafe. Um, avoid, we are working very hard with all of our partners around the world to give you advice to avoid exposure to reduce your chance of getting infected, you reduce your chance of passing the virus onward. This is critical right now. It is not the time to retreat, it is not the time to give up because we have these tools. Mike, nor I, nor you have said lockdown. We have not said that. We are not talking about shutting down societies. What we're talking about is increasing coverage of vaccines, making sure people have access, as well as simple measures to keep yourself safe, distancing, working from home if you can, and many people have found through this pandemic that you can, um, access to testing, wearing of a well-fitted mask over your nose and mouth, avoiding crowds, improving ventilation. We're in a very well-ventilated room right now, um, but investing in that where we live, where we work, where we study. So all of those things matter, that layered approach. So please do what you can to avoid infection. Thank you both. Uh, we've already received quite a lot of follow-up questions. Um, maybe one is again, uh, as you provided, epidemiological update is on mortality data from Omicron. Um, as you addressed that uh, there is some thinking out there that Omicron is mild or causes mild disease, as Mike clarified, on average, yes, but not for everyone. So do we have any data on mortality rates from Omicron? So this is a little bit more difficult to come by because Omicron started circulating uh, really late November, early December. Um, and so as this virus spreads more, people are getting infected. It takes time for people to go through their course of infection and disease. Um, and we don't have all of the outcome data for people who have been infected with Omicron. It's also difficult in populations where both Omicron and Delta are circulating. If somebody is hospitalized, sometimes we know if they're infected with Omicron or Delta because sequencing is done, but we, we don't always know that. So we're still learning about the full disease course. And so, as Mike has said, at, you know, on average, your risk of hospitalization developing severe disease with Omicron is less than Delta. But we do know that mortality increases with Omicron with increasing age. We have some data from some countries that show this. We also have data um, from some countries that show that people with at least one underlying condition are at an increased risk of hospitalization and death, even if you have Omicron as compared to Delta. So there are the risk factors that we know that put people at an increased risk are the same for Omicron as they are for Delta. Um, but I do, we don't have the percentages right now of how many people will die. Um, and I think you know it's, it's a good question um, to have that, but we don't have all that answer yet because it does take some time for to go through that full course of infection. Thank you so much. Um, several people are asking what are the symptoms of Omicron and if there are any difference to previously identified variants? No difference at all. Um, very similar. 
uh, disease, uh, mainly affecting the upper respiratory, lower respiratory areas, but lots of other symptoms like headache and other things that you would have with uh, with uh, respiratory illness. And then obviously some rarer presentations or signs, uh, 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 people can present with more severe syndrome, but in the main it's presenting exactly the same way. But as we said, probably presenting in a milder fashion. Uh, and again, we have to be careful with that world milder because many people, when we look at, for example, in South Africa, many people already had a previous natural infection. So they were kind of immunized naturally. So then Omicron comes along and it's not very severe. Is that because they've got a memory in their immune system of a SARS virus and they fight off Omicron better? Or is that because Omicron is better at infecting them? Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the same with the, the vaccines. People, uh, you know, so we have, to be, we have to be careful in terms of uh, making those comparisons. But no, it's, it's very much the same disease. Um, it's just a very different, a slightly different sequence. Mm -hmm. And that sequence uh, is affecting the way in which the proteins that make up the virus are made and the shape of those proteins. And that effectively impacts the ability of the virus to enter the cell or what kind of cells it can enter most effectively. So it makes the virus fitter or better able to do certain things. Um, and uh, certainly it appears to be better at getting into cells, into human cells and infecting. Uh, whether that's you need less viruses or each virus is more effective uh, and that the infectious dose is actually lower uh, or that the virus is, survives better in, in, in the environment or <coughs> survives better in aerosols and in droplets. And you, you can then have a situation where the same amount of virus been expelled by an individual will cause more disease. We also have a lot of information suggesting that the virus, a very small number of individuals represent, uh, have very high viral loads. So again, that same uh, phenomenon, I think, that occurred with other variants in that it's not always, each case does not infect exactly the same number of people afterwards. Um, mathematically, that's true. But in reality, there are some individuals and certainly some settings. And if you put someone with high viral loads, into a setting indoors in a crowded situation with poor ventilation and no one's wearing a mask, it's it, that, yeah, you really have created those perfect storms. And we've seen a lot of that. And we many people will have heard over the holidays of, you know, situations where families got together and 25 people and three days later, 20 people are positive. I mean, that's clearly, there have been a number of, ins and then you hear about other situations where everyone got together and, nobody was infected and sometimes it's very hard to understand um, but that's the way uh, that's the way disease transmission goes not every human being is infected in the same way not every human being processes the virus in the same way and the number of viruses that any individual person um, has in their body or can excrete or pass on is much different so uh, it, it's 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 fascinating and at the same time frightening to think about two years on how little, frankly, we've learned a lot. We have learned a lot about the virus. We've learned a lot about transmission. But it's also quite frightening how little we know uh, about some of the fundamental issues associated with this virus and its transmission. I wanted to pick up on the part uh, that, that Mike just said around like the learning. Like There's still so much that we don't know. But I think we also need to recognize that we're not starting from scratch. You know, Even with Omicron as a new variant, we have to remember that we, we have learned a lot. Not everything. Not enough. And, and there's a lot of researchers that are out there that are contributing to our knowledge base. But we know, and as Mike pointed out, it's estimated that you know, around 10 uh, transmission, 10 percent, 10 to 20 percent of all cases are responsible for about 80% of transmission events. We knew that from other variants. The question will be, will that be the same you know, for Omicron? But there's no reason to think differently. And we know that setting is critically important. Distance is critically important. The setting, if there's poor ventilation, if we're crowded, if I'm screaming at you, or if I'm not talking, if I have a mask on or if I don't, all of those factors will, will um, affect transmission. But even in terms of disease severity, disease presentation, the symptoms, Remember with the ancestral strain, in the beginning of this pandemic, we had this, this 20, uh, this, you know, 80%, 40% of patients would present with mild disease, 40% would have moderate disease, 15% would have severe disease, and 5% would have critical disease. That was what we knew from the beginning. And then it was estimated around 
20 percent, 20 to 40 percent of people had either asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic disease, around 20 percent asymptomatic. What do those percentages look like now? But now we have different testing. Now we have people that are showing up early that are getting tested. And I think there's so much that we need to learn about this. This is sort of the uh, what is critical about the collaborations that WHO has, and we're so grateful for all of our partners around the world that are doing this. This is why it's important that we continue to have testing. Um, and we do also have to recognize in the third year of this COVID-19 pandemic, we are now starting to see circulation of other respiratory pathogens. Um, influenza is circulating again, and it is very difficult, if not impossible, to, st to distinguish between influenza flu and COVID-19. So testing helps with that. So that's why you know we're asking people to be careful and to reduce your exposure, um, and to get tested when when necessary. But lots and lots to still learn about this uh, virus. Thank you, Maria. Here's a question that I think you addressed, but maybe you want to add something from Andrew watching us on LinkedIn. Does viral load determine how you will get uh, infected, uh, or can it manifest more internally? So that's an interesting question. So we we look at when we look at when somebody transmits, we consider not just the setting in which that transmission happens, but we also look at the patient, the person themselves, um, and if they are infected, if they have symptoms or not. We know people without symptoms can transmit. We also know people with symptoms can transmit. And if we look at the viral load, if we look at how much virus somebody has, that amount of virus that somebody has when they are infected changes over time. And if we look at sampling of individuals over time, these are very difficult studies to do, and frankly, there's not a lot of them out there. What we want to do is, is test people uh, serial sampling every day before they develop symptoms, when they develop symptoms, and all the way through their disease progression. What we understand from those studies, and actually we have a meeting tomorrow, internal meeting tomorrow, to look at any updated data on this, people are most infectious, they have the highest amount of virus in their system, right around the time they develop symptoms. And you have to remember, for COVID-19, people can have very, very mild, very, very mild symptoms. I feel a little bit unwell. I mean, I'm feeling tired, or I've lost my sense of taste, or I have a headache, or I develop a fever. Um, it's right around that time, about two days before, and through the first five to nine days, people are most, about the first five days, people are most infectious. And then it decreases with time. If you are severe, if you have a severe form of COVID-19, you can transmit the virus for up to three weeks. Um, and there are some populations, immunocompromised patients, that can transmit even further. But the highest viral load is right around the time people develop symptoms. Um, and I think that's important because that has implications for isolation of, of cases. And it is critical um, that we still isolate confirmed cases, as well as quarantining of contacts. Because our goal, as you know, a global organization, and, and, and to try to bring an end to this pandemic, is to not only reduce the severe end of the spectrum, but also to reduce transmission. So that's a really, really good question. And so if you have a high viral load and you infect somebody, you may need less virus for me to infect you, for example. And that setting becomes really, really important because either you breathe it in and it goes into your lungs or I deposit those um, particles on you. The, the droplets are the larger ones and they tend to fall more quickly, but the aerosols can, can, can move further. And again, if the space has poor ventilation, it can move beyond that conversational distance. So it's a great question. And I think um, <clears throat> for many viruses, it's hypothesized that depending on how much virus you're exposed to for how long, that can affect your likelihood to get infected. In other words, my chances of having an infection are very much increased if I'm exposed to a lot of the virus, but also the severity of the disease you experience. Um, and this is why often we thought in Ebola, for example, that health workers had a much higher death rate when they got Ebola than uh, than. Uh, very often the patients they were treating, and you'd imagine it should be different because they're generally better off, they're generally, you know, have better general health profile, they have access to care, um, and a lot of that is thought to be to do with the exposure dose, that they're exposed to very high doses or through an injection and the, the virus is directly inoculated into the body and not just contaminating the skin or a wound. So the 
the dose you're exposed to, and that can be increased by just the, the route by which you're exposed, or the timing. And Maria you said, if you're in a room for an hour with someone who's excreting virus and you're inhaling viruses over a long period of time, then uh, clearly your exposure dose can be very high. And you can just, this is, I suppose it's pretty logical for most people. The reality is the more viruses that get through the gates at one time, the more likely it is your system gets overwhelmed. Your immune system needs time. It needs time to detect the virus. It needs time to react to the virus presence. It needs time to build up the antibodies and generate a response. It's like anything. If someone invades a country, it, they, they want to do it by stealth, and they want to invade before the defenses are able to push back. Um, so you can just imagine if you get 10 times the number of viruses in the body at the beginning, the likelihood is the immune system is not able to react as quickly as it would, and the viruses get around the system and get to do more damage. So it's not some, it's not big rocket science. Uh, we can explain it very in a very sophisticated way, but it really is uh, very much to do with that principle, um, and it's also uh, to do with the with the fact that. Uh, where you get infected. So again, with Omicron, there's some preliminary data, and it's very preliminary data, to show that these, um, uh, the Omicron variant has a preference for the upper respiratory tract and doesn't infect the lower respiratory tract uh, as well as the previous variants, which again, would, again we don't, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to say, okay, well, if the virus is preferentially infecting the nose and not so good at infecting the lung, then you'd imagine the disease might be less severe, which we're seeing at some part in the data. So what we're always trying to do is triangulate what we're seeing clinically, what we're seeing epidemiologically, what's been seen in the lab and making sure that, okay, that that agrees with that, what we're observing. And very often then you observe that there's a contradiction and the data in the lab doesn't agree with the data in the real world. And that's when you get confused. Uh, so it's, it's really important as we build up that picture. So the interaction of viruses and humans is, is very interesting thing to study because a lot of the impact that a virus will have can depend on your baseline level of health. It can depend on whether your immune system is in good shape or not. It can depend whether you've had a recent infection and had your immune system somewhat suppressed by the, by the, uh, by the that fact. Um, so there are all kinds of reasons to have good health, and and if you have good physical health and good emotional health and good mental health, and you're not under stress, then it's much more likely your immune system is in much better shape and able to deal with whatever comes along. And I say that because you know we talk about vaccines, and right now the vaccines are the things saving the lives. But we shouldn't move away from the fact that there are general principles of good health general principles of looking after yourself, looking after your nutrition, looking after sleep, looking after stress, because they're the things too that will give you, number one, the resistance to infection, uh, and also if you are infected, give you the, 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 the strength to fight off that infection more quickly. So it's not just the virus load that affects that, and that's what we've seen in people with underlying conditions. They get the same virus load as the person sitting next to them, but because they have unmanaged hypertension, because they have severe diabetes, because they have these long-standing health conditions, their body is not as well equipped to deal with the virus and they get more inflammatory responses to the presence of the virus. So <clears throat> it's not just the viral load. I'm sorry I'm going on a bit about this, but I think it's a fascinating thing because we live in balance like in nature, and we live in balance with these microbes. And we have millions and millions of good microbes in our guts and in our ears and our noses in our mouths. You know, we live in a kind of a symbiotic relationship with the, with the microbial world. And I, I would hate to think that people would see the, the, the microscopic world as our enemy or the microscopic world as something, um, you know, dark and destructive to us. In fact, for the most part, the microbial world gives us what we have to eat on our tables with the microbes in soil. It allows us to digest food properly from the microbes we have in our gut. Very often that natural microbial inhabitants of your, of your respiratory system protects you from other microbes. In other words, you have good microbes that kind of keep the others out. They're the friendly ones. Uh, so all of that's really important. And if you have things going on in your general health, that reduce your basic uh, mucosal health, reduce your basic ability of your immune system to cope, then you can have more severe infections. So I think it's important that 
we don't just rely on vaccines and we don't just rely on treatments. We have to focus too on our general state of health and our general state of immunologic health, and it's very important. Here is, I, I think, very good follow-up question from Julie, Julie Casellato McCann, watching us on Facebook. How long is a person that has tested positive contagious for? So Maria explained that there is a period minus two plus five, it nine. Depends on, it depends on if you have uh, symptoms or not. Um, so this is what our isolation criteria is actually based on. And so what I described, you know, the minus two, up to two days before symptom onset, up to maybe nine days for a mild patient when we, pe when we believe people can spread the virus. Again, it, it changes over time. That dynamics changes over the time, and people are most infectious right around the time they develop symptoms. Um, but for severe patients, it could be longer. It could be up to three weeks. Um, and for immunocompromised patients, it could be longer than that. Um, so it depends. And asymptomatic individuals can also um, transmit the virus as well. So it, it, it will depend. But then how and where people transmit also depend on all of these other factors. Yeah, and something, uh, it's a funny thing. I don't know. Many of you out there will have been in airports. You know, when you go up to the, the sign and it says your gate, and it says walking time 15 minutes, <laughs> and it's 15 minutes to take off, and you go r running because you think it's going to take 15 minutes to get there. And a minute later, you arrive. Two minutes later, you arrive at the gate, and you think, they were lying. They said 15-minute walk. But what they're doing is saying, that's a 15-minute walk for an average person, or a 15-minute walk for someone who's got a walking stick. In other words, they, they want to give a, a realistic, but, but generally a generous time to say it. It doesn't mean everyone will take 15 minutes to go from here to the gate. What they're giving is a time, you better make sure you allow 15 minutes. Because most people will get to the gate in 15 minutes. And I think it's important, again, people understand that when we put something down and we say most people are infectious for from minus two to plus six days, that's true. But there will be people who are infectious for eight days, nine days, 10 days, 11 days, 100 days yeah. in some cases. But they are the exception to the rule. And therefore, we plan according to what we consider where will the vast majority of people fit in to the category. The vast majority of people, in the case of, uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-2, are infectious usually just before they get symptoms or uh, until about five or six five days, six days uh, after. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it stops there. And there are lots of cases of people who continue to transmit. But you, know, you can't make public policy on the basis that one person was shown to be infectious for 100 days. Then you could say, okay, everyone has to isolate for 100 days. On the face of it, that makes no sense. So, and that's, so, not, what and that's, not, what that's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is, and this is, uh, I've said this before, the difference between scientific evidence and policy. Yep. Scientific evidence is a scientific description of the reality of what's happening. Policy is how you interpret that science to implement public health for the good of people where you're balancing the benefit you're going to get from saying everyone must isolate for 10 days, 14 days, 6 days. So when countries now are considering reducing the period of isolation to 6 days uh, after the onset of symptoms, they're not right or wrong in scientific terms. In scientific terms, they're making a decision. And a proportion of people will be infectious after that. But the benefit to that approach is that more people get back to work earlier. But some of those people will go back to work infectious. Very small proportion, but they will. Uh, and that's the acceptable uh, trade-off that a government makes if it's trying, for example, to you know, police the country and it has to have X minimum number of policemen or prison officers or, or pilots or whatever. Um, and I think it's really because sometimes we get asked here, well, you know, they're they wrong in the decision they make. There's no policy decision that's inertly wrong. If the policy decision, decision may not respect the science, that's more. That's different. <coughs> that's different. So, we're we're positive about policy decisions that are aware of the science, listen to the science, examine the science, and then recognize, and be explicit and be honest with people when your decision and policy goes beyond the science and other factors are influencing that decision, be explicit. Don't force the science to give you the justification for making a policy decision, because that's happened a lot in this pandemic. 
uh, too much. And the difference with what we do, and especially Mike and I sitting at the global level, we issue guidance for all member states, for everyone everywhere. And what we do is we take the evidence and we write the guidance. There's a difference between the evidence and guidance and what policies countries make because the countries are making policy decisions based on a number of different factors. Isolation or quarantine is, is one example of that. And so the science is what it is. You know, we tell you what we see, here's what the evidence says, and the policy decisions take that into account, but also take this risk benefit into having to get people back to work. But there's a trade-off, as Mike has said, and I think that's the difference. We work with our regional offices. We have six regional offices. We have 150 country offices. We set guidance at a global level. Our regions look at that and say, okay, how does this fit with the countries that are within the regions that we are responsible for, our member states? And then the countries themselves have to look at that and see what further adaptation is necessary. And so that's why you see some flexibility. And what we aim to do in our guidance issued at a global level is provide those options that countries can can use uh, the you know those considerations that countries need to take into account when setting the policies, but as Mike has said, and I wholeheartedly agree, just be open and honest about what those policies are, um, because that's what is is really critical right now. Say what the balance is and that you're measuring, and be very clear about that. And also, policies change, guidance changes because science changes; it, it's growing over time. So we recognize that and we've tried to be humble throughout this entire pandemic. We don't have all the answers. We don't get it right all of the time. We know that. Um, but we, we, we constantly are looking at it and to see what needs to be adapted and change, it, and change over time and to communicate that as clearly as we possibly can, especially by doing these types of live Q&As. Thank you both. Uh, there are a lot of questions more coming in. Uh, Cheryl, also watching us on LinkedIn, is asking if you can help explain the breakthrough infections when you're fully vaccinated. So, Mike, you were talking about the importance of immunology and immune system. So maybe you can explain this as well. Um, yeah, a small proportion of people um, don't generate a, a full immune response in response to a vaccine. In other words, the system doesn't recognize the vaccine as such as well as other systems and it doesn't just generate the full immune response to the presence of the vaccine so in a sense it's people call it a vaccine failure as in the the, the vaccine doesn't stimulate that response um, um, uh, for the uh, and that may be in one or two or three or four percent of cases depending on, on vaccine um, and all vaccines have that potential that they just don't get the response it can often happen in an immunocompromised individual who is finding it difficult to man to to mount a response or in older persons whose immune systems are a little bit more fragile they don't they just don't produce the immune response required and that's why you're often seeing now that the booster doses are being used very much in older populations or people with underlying conditions in order to give their system like like it says on the tin a boost um, but even in someone who's had an infection, or sorry, had a vaccine and had a good Im immunologic response, um, the, um, there's an, an immunologic memory set up. Uh, and the first response to that is you get antibodies, uh, immunoglobulins that are produced. And uh, the, there's a set of immunoglobulins produced in the beginning, which are the initial ones that are produced, and they're produced in high numbers, I, IgM. And, and, and then there's a more long-term production of a kind of a, there's the initial fighters to fight the disease, and then the immune system sets up a fairly high level of long-term protectors. And they're kind of protecting you for maybe that first six months or a year. They're kind of the, the afterguard, after the, after the battle, there's a kind of a group of antibodies that stick around and keep an eye out to see if the virus is there. But you can imagine the system has to deal with many infections every year. So it has to, the immune system has to, it can't put all its resources into waiting for the same virus to come back. It's, it's responding to other challenges all the time in the system. So over time, the, 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 the level of those antibodies drops and the body stops producing uh, lots and lots of those uh, immunoglobulins, IgGs. But underneath that, there is the, 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 the immune, the, the memory cells that keep the memory of the, the T cells, that keep a kind of a long-term memory of the virus. Now, if the virus comes back, they will react. It'll take slightly longer. They'll have to develop those antibodies again. And so it's not like being um, 
reinfected because you're not starting from scratch. You have this immunologic memory in, the, in this other system. So you have that sort of immunoglobulin system, the antibody system, but then you have these T cell systems that can that, that uh, maintain this longer term protection. If you have repeated infections or repeated vaccines, what often happens is the level of antibody goes back up very quickly. And at the same time, you get this conditioning of that long term memory. So not only are you getting an increase, and maybe with the boosters right now, we're not just seeing an increase in antibody level, but we're seeing that conditioning, longer term conditioning of the immune system. We would hope that there is a point at which the system develops a longer term in immunolog immunologic memory, and we've seen that. Uh, most people who get, in, get a reinfected have a mild infection, so in effect, they're, not having a break they're having a breakthrough infection, but they're not getting very sick. So, in other words, the virus is still capable of infecting them, but it's not making them so ill. Part of this, and it's very complicated, is that we're giving the vaccine in the arm. We're giving parenteral vaccine. We're injecting the vaccine into the body. But the site of infection is usually on the surface of the nasal mucosa or the lung mucosa, or the, the air pipes. So, in effect, we're vaccinating someone against, in, in, in the sort of in their deep body, uh, giving their anti creating antibodies inside the person, which means that protects the person very often against the more severe impacts of the disease. But it doesn't really set up the defenses at the point where the virus enters. And we see this in polio. We use injectable polio uh, vaccine, which really prevents paralysis. But the oral polio vaccines are the ones that prevent infection. So therefore, it's going to be very hard with an injectable vaccine to get perfect prevention of infection. Because some of the viruses can always come back, get in your nose, cause a local infection, may make you PCR positive, and you might get a runny nose. You mightn't feel sick at all, because the vaccine that's in your body, the stuff that's been injected, is creating this kind of uh, long-term corporeal sort of body-wide protection against severe disease. Uh, so in that sense, breakthrough infections can occur. Uh, people can be in reinfected even after they've had a, a natural infection or had a, a vaccine infection. In general, a reinfection is less severe uh, than in the case of a primary infection. And, and uh, again, it's the reason why we've been very keen to make sure that people with underlying conditions, immunocompromised, older persons, get full courses of vaccination and, in some cases, boosters, in order to ensure that we kind of ramp up their level of protection. But again, we're going back to this issue of the immu immune system. It's a fascinating system, and those of you out there who are studying science or have an interest in it, it, it really is, because this balance we have to strike uh, between how we react to the world around us, because we see in the case of even in the case of um, SARS-CoV-2 that a lot of the really severe illness is because of an overreaction. Uh, we see this in the case of rheumatoid arthritis and many autoimmune diseases. That this immune system is a powerful weapon we have, and it's been a huge weapon in allowing humans to survive on this planet. But it's also a weapon that can turn against us. Uh, and it can cause inflammation in its own right. So understanding the dynamics of the human immune system and how it's finely balanced to give us maximum protection with minimum harm, right? And, and so much can affect that. The virus can affect it, the environment, your general state of health, or whether or not you have a vaccine on board. And right now, uh, when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, the single most effective thing you can do to protect your health in the case of SARS-CoV, in the case of COVID-19, is to get vaccinated. Because that gives your immune system the best possible chance of reacting properly to the presence of this virus. Thank you, Mike. And uh, speaking of those vulnerable populations and 3 billion people that Maria mentioned who don't have access to any dose yet, one of our viewers was asking how we can help those people to get access to vaccines. So maybe we can remind them of that. There's a lot. There's a lot that can be done. I mean, uh, you know, first and foremost, we need to hold our leaders accountable for, you know, coming through with the pledges and the um, promises uh, that are being made about allowing access to these life-saving vaccines. Um, countries around the world are not asking for charity. Um, they just want to be able to purchase the vaccine so that they can protect their own populations. So, as individuals, you can 
right to your leaders. Uh, you can fight vocally. We need more voices. The Director General said the other day, we need your voices to fight for vaccine equity around the world um, because we need so many uh, people around the world who are vulnerable to have those first and second doses before others get more. And I think there's a lot that people can do, and I think we need more, more voices out there to do that. And I think, you know, what Mike has said and what we've been saying is that, you know, the single best thing you can do is get vaccinated because it's, it is saving lives. Vaccines are saving lives. They do a pretty good job against preventing infection and reinfection and transmission, but they're not perfect for that. The intention of a vaccine is to prevent severe disease and death. And they are incredibly, it's astounding that we have so many safe and effective vaccines. There was no guarantee at the beginning of this pandemic. Um, you know, we had lots of discussions of whether we would have a vaccine that would be 30% effective or 50% effective. And the vaccines that we have out there are incredibly effective, 80, 90, you know, close to 100% for preventing severe disease and death. But they're not, they don't prevent all infections and they don't prevent all transmissions, but they do a pretty good job. It's about 50% or so or 60%. It's a pretty good job for that. Um, so that's why we say the vaccines and so please fight for vaccine equity around the world use your voices write to your leaders to fight for this um, the more voices that are out there um, the better so as individuals as community leaders as business owners as, as politicians as faith-based leaders as youth um, help us um, be part of this um, collective voice to fight for this around the world yeah, and within that, uh, please remember, uh, this isn't an individual moral issue. If you're offered a vaccine, take the vaccine. If you're offered a second vaccine, take the vaccine. If you're offered a booster, take the booster. Don't feel, no individual on this planet should feel that they're the ones in a, in, in a moral grey zone. If you're offered the vaccine, take it. Um, what we need is people then who get that vaccine to become advocates for vaccination. Uh, with their friends, with their families, with politicians, with everyone else. We've got the UNICEF uh, Get One, Give One campaign, which you know allows people to donate funds based on getting a vaccine and saying we can donate. There are lots of ways you can contribute to the to that whole process uh, through NGOs and others who are working with marginalized populations. Uh, many of the humanitarian agencies are working to get vaccines to some of the most vulnerable people in humanitarian settings and in conflict. So there are lots of ways, even through your the, the existing way in which you contribute, uh, you can continue uh, continue to do that and uh, so I think and even get involved yourselves out there there are marginalized communities in every country this isn't just an issue uh, in the developing world there are people who have not had access to vaccines because they're homeless or because they're marginalized or they live in detention or whatever it may be and everyone has the power to ensure that at least one other person will get vaccinated. And if we think about it, you said it, there's three billion people on the, the planet haven't been fully vaccinated, maybe four and a half who have. So if every person who's been vaccinated could guarantee that one more person got vaccinated, job done. Um, there are issues in terms of um, making sure too that, you know, countries, donating countries, uh, manufacturers and others give very clear timelines for the delivery of vaccines. So it's not just about the amount of vaccines people are getting. It's making sure that that the vaccines are arriving with good lead time, that everyone knows when they're arriving. They're arriving in good condition and they're arriving with expiry dates that allow the vaccine to be stored and used properly and not used in a rushed way, which can lead to mistakes and leads to inefficiency. So there are lots of things that people can do. But more, I think the biggest thing everyone can do now is keep this on the agenda. Mm -hmm. If we can't get this right, if we can't get vaccine equity right, where are we going to get climate justice right. Everyone's talking since Glasgow COP, you know, the least wealthy in the world, the most marginalized in the world are going to pay the biggest price for global warming. One group warmed the world, the other group will pay the price. And that's a huge issue. I don't know how we're going to address it. If we can't address the simple issue of the equity of every individual on this planet having access to a protective course of vaccine against a pandemic, if we can't do that, how in God's name are we going to deal with the bigger issues of climate justice and social justice that we face in the world. So this is a real test in my view. This is a test of our resolve. This is a simple product, a simple injection that's life-saving, that's affordable, it's available. We have enough in the world right now to do the job. And if we can't, we can't distribute that fairly, 
then, uh, you know, I don't know where we're going in terms of all the other great dreams and aspirations we have to be a fairer world or to be a healthier world or to be a safer world uh, or to be a more just world. So it, to me, it's a real test of our resolve. Um, and it's moving slowly. It's not without hope. Uh, we are seeing an acceleration in the availability of vaccines and you know great credit to our colleagues who work on the vaccination side of the equation here in, in WHO and uh, UNICEF in all the other agencies in Gavi and CEPI and others there's a great coalition of organizations working together to try and you know achieve this and many civil society organizations out there many ING, uh, non-governmental organizations community groups my, I take my hat off to them all because that ship is beginning to turn. We're starting to see that momentum. And we're starting to see every month almost a doubling of vaccines being available through the COVAX initiative. So I'm, I, we're not here to, to wave shrouds and say it's terrible. No, we were beginning to move. But we need to move now. We need to move even quicker now. Because we've got a deadline coming up that we've set. And the, the Tedros has called for that for 70% of the world's population to be fully vaccinated by, I think, uh, June, the end of June. Um, and, uh, and remember, many, many countries haven't got to 10% or even 40%, so we're way behind. But, uh, but I have hope because I can see, you know, sometimes when a big ship turns, uh, it, 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 it can achieve an awful lot, and I can see that happening. And there is an initiative now <clears throat> as well amongst the agencies to accelerate and improve the way in which countries are using vaccine. Because we do have a few, many fragile countries affected by conflict in which the infrastructure in the country and the logistics are really not up to par and we, we have to work harder to ensure we can get to every vulnerable person across the country. So there's a, there's a, a, a big push at the moment between WHO, UNICEF and other agencies to really accelerate our support to the countries to ensure that as these vaccine availability accelerates, the ability to deliver vaccines in countries will equally accelerate. And that work is ongoing. It's under the leadership of a good colleague of ours, Ted Chibon from, um, from UNICEF. And, and so it's bringing together and redoubling our efforts because at the end of the day, we can... You know, we can be telling everyone else what they should be doing. Government should be doing this and people should be doing that. But what we should all be doing is looking in the mirror every day and saying, what should I be doing better? Uh, what can I do better? What, I, what can I do more of? And we do that in WHO and say, OK, where do we need to improve our performance? How do we improve our support to our member states? How do we um, improve our uh, service to the most vulnerable communities in the world. Because if you look in the mirror every day and you say, I'm perfect, it's everybody else's fault, then <laughs> then you're not getting anywhere. Um, so it'll be really good. I, I, I think communities and societies are getting an increasing voice in this pandemic. Uh, sometimes I really like the questions that come in here. Sometimes I find the questions that you pick up are, are much more fingers on the pulse than some of the other stuff that we get. So. Society, community as a whole. Hmm? That's why we keep coming back. No, we come back because we're afraid of Alex. You don't know that. <laughs> we're afraid of saying no. <laughs> That's my excuse anyway. No, I, I actually, I find these really enjoyable because it gives us an opportunity to have a dialogue. We get to talk about these things beyond the, the single question that comes at a press conference. Mm -hmm. gives us an opportunity to explain things. And this is complex. I mean, all of these topics are are really, really complex. So we're, we're very grateful to have this opportunity. I hope that we don't have to continue to do these, which means that the pandemic is ending and that we're getting closer to that. And we can do that this year. I mean, fighting for this vaccine equity and getting 70% of all populations in all countries vaccinated by, 20, by June 2022 is, is key to that. Yeah. Um, we have to fight for that. We also have to make sure that we minimize transmission so we don't have more variants that you know bring us back closer towards the starting gates here but we can do this and i think that's why we're so hopeful it's, it's about like what do we do every day but we're also hopeful because we have tools so don't give up you know even though we're seeing omicron we're seeing record case numbers um and people i, I mean you know i'm hearing you know I, I know so many people that are infected there's still a lot that we can do can i also just just say a, a special also shout out to health workers I'm hearing an increasing number of stories about health workers continuing to be overwhelmed, overburdened. So the other thing that you can do out there as a general public is to keep yourself safe so that you don't need clinical care. Um, because systems are overburdened, we have to also thank our health workers. I, you know, I'm reading, I read this fantastic article this week 
um, a sobering, sad, intelligent article looking at health workers and how you know, people around the world are not really thanking them anymore. You know, that, that kindness that we saw in the beginning of this, this pandemic, that sol solidarity is not quite there anymore. We need to keep that up because part of the morale of getting us through this is looking out for each other. And those acts of kindness that you can have with your neighbor or your health worker or your teacher or whomever, please continue to do so. Um, because we really need that to drive us through. We're all exhausted. We know you are exhausted as well. We need to keep that up. Um, we're, we're a social human society. We need that connection. And even though we can't still be physically together, we still need to keep that up. So be kind, please. Fight this virus, not each other. Reach out to your health workers and just say thank you. Just do, just do an act of kindness every day. Thank you both. Um, I think I need to pass a few more complex questions from excellent viewers. Um, Maria, maybe we can try to make this short. There are, there are concerns and several viewers were asking about those reports where people are infected with Delta and Omicron at the same time and what do we know about that. But on the other side, as you both mentioned, that there are other infections circulating about the reports of patients who, ha who have got uh, COVID and flu uh, at the same time and how dangerous is that? can be infected with, with two viruses at the same time. We have had uh, examples of co-infection with influenza and SARS-CoV-2 throughout this pandemic. Um, there was a recent systematic review that was published that looked at the, pre at the prevalence of this. They also looked at whether or not people had more severe disease if they were infected with both. Uh, and what that review found was that they didn't have more severe disease. But we have to see what happens with Omicron and influenza as influenza starts to circulate again. Mm. As we increase mixing, um, as we have, as people are coming together, and as flu starts to circulate, we're starting to see increasing numbers of influenza around the world, and that can happen out of season. Influenza has a typical season. We know when it should start to increase, and given the last two years and how people have mixed, we've we've messed that up a little bit. So we can have co-infection with influenza and and um, SARS-CoV-2. This this uh, phrase Delta Cron which suggests that people have, that Delta and Omicron have combined, is not really a thing. Um, in fact, what we think that is, is that it's a result of contamination that has happened during the sequencing process. So we discussed it, we've discussed it with our virus evolution work group, our, our technical advisory group on virus evolution. Um, and so we need to make sure that that's not uh, you know, a truth that is out there that is circulating. Having said that, you can be infected with different strains of um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so there's, there are a lot of options that are out there. So from a general public point of view, again, what you can do to minimize your exposure to both SARS, uh, COVID-2 and influenza, you know, this will benefit you. And for those of you that are, that are eligible for a flu vaccine, please also get your flu vaccination. Flu is, is an incredibly serious disease for people, particularly of older age, people who have underlying conditions, pregnant women. So please make sure that if you have access to a flu vaccine, that you get your flu vaccine as well, because vaccines uh, save lives. And just on the issue of co-infection with two different SARS uh, viruses or SARS-CoV-2 viruses, two variants, we, you know, we want to avoid it, people are being exposed to one. Uh, having a co both infection at the same time, shouldn't result in a more severe disease for you as an individual, but what it does allow is the opportunity uh, for the virus to recombine, and that can happen. Uh, uh, it can happen, it happens more in animals than it does in humans, but it can certainly happen. And there is, normally the virus evolves through a kind of form of antigenic drift, sequential mutations, small changes over many generations. Uh, and that's the normal way that the uh, SARS coronaviruses evolve. Uh, but there is a process called recombination where you can have a very rapid exchange if, if, if a single human cell is infected with two different variants of the virus. What emerges uh, is a brand new virus, almost a brand new virus. And that's often the way this recombination process where you get these big jumps in viral evolution in the animal kingdom of viral ev evolution. Um, and that's something we want to avoid in the animal kingdom and in the human kingdom. So there's, there are good reasons to avoid any infection with SARS-CoV and probably even better reasons to try and avoid double infection or having a co-infection. But I, I haven't seen any data to suggest that co-infection 
in you as an individual has any consequence uh, for making it more severe. These phrases, these, you know, when you combine two words together, they sound really scary. Um, and we need to be careful. Other people would avoid using them. Yeah, we've, we've asked, I, I tweeted about this the other day, specifically <coughs> asking people not to use this and not to not to push that out there. There's there's also combinations of words with flu and Omicron. And, and I would I would request you know, respectfully to really not perpetuate that because it's it that's not what is happening. Um, and we need to avoid those types of scary terms. Thank you both. Thank you for your time today and uh, for sharing what we know at the moment about Omicron and the current situation. I thank all our viewers for their questions. Uh, there have been really a lot of them, so I we couldn't take them all this time, um, but we will do continue with these sessions next week. Until then, please follow our social media channels and our website for all the updates, and please be safe. Thank you.